Yep. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to this seminar on atrocity prevention in an illiberal world. First of all, I'd like our director Guri to say a couple of words about the center and the building that you're in. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's so great to have you here, and we know that some more people will turn up. It's a rainy day in Oslo, and people cannot always plan the buses and the time. But anyway, welcome to this seminar. Uh, we're really proud. I know that some of you actually attended yesterday uh, this workshop here. And um, so I just uh, want to tell you that please use some time when you're here to look in the building if you haven't seen. This is you're really in a historic building. 100 years ago, built by a Norwegian industrialist, uh, first builder in, in 1917. So this building is actually is, um, is touched to World War One and World War Two. During World War Two, this was actually uh, grabbed by the Nazi leader, Wittgen Quisling, who used this building as his residence, and he took the castle, the royal castle, as his office. Uh, and you spent a lot of money. So you see, actually, you're in his party, his grand hall. This is his old grand hall, but we have changed it all. We have modernized it. Uh, now we use it for movies, lectures, seminars, educational programs for a teacher. So the whole idea by using the Holocaust Center and placing it in this building is actually to turn to history 180 degrees and tell another story. And we do every day. And we just opened one month ago, um, or is it two months ago soon, uh, a new building for uh, temporary exhibitions on actually contemporary issues. And uh, if you haven't seen, I know some of you yesterday saw the new exhibition on everyday racism. If you didn't see it yesterday and you were not here, please use the opportunity to look at uh, this new exhibition and also have a look in the Holocaust exhibition, which actually is quite uh, now up to date. We have. We took the opportunity uh, because we had two holes in the old building to make this fantastic glass bridge and we have now included the history, history of the Norwegian Roma in the Holocaust exhibition. And a lot of Holocaust exhibition around the world only deals with the Jews. We also now have the Roma because we've done substantial research on the fate of Norwegian Roma, which ended in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And we have all the names and we have documented that and we're proud of that. So we actually it's a quite updated uh, Holocaust exhibition as well. So anyway, I do look forward to listening to the keynote speaker and I'll leave the word back to you, Ellen, and have a nice day and have a nice seminar. Welcome. And also welcome to those who are following us online. We know that there are some guests who would, like, who would have liked to be in here today who are following the, the streaming the topic of today is atrocity prevention in an illiberal world, the role of a small state in the UN Security Council. Norway, as all of you know, has a seat in the Security Council at the moment. How can a country such as Norway prevent atrocities like genocide and crimes against humanity? Is the responsibility to protect R2P doctrine too contested in the current world order? What are lessons learned from other member states of the Security Council, such as, for example, Sweden? These are the topics we're going to discuss today, and we have some interesting and distinguished guests uh, to take part in the panel discussion. We have Cecilia Hellestweit from the Norwegian Academy of International Law. We have Angela Mavumba Selström from the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden and we have Christopher Lidén from the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. But first of all, let me welcome uh, Karen Smith, who's with us today from the Netherlands. Um, she was until recently the special advisor of the Secretary General on the responsibility to protect. Currently, she's a lecturer in international relations at the Institute for History at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Welcome, Karen, please. Let us know what a small state should do to prevent atrocities. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. OK, 
Okay, good morning everyone. It's lovely to be here in Oslo. Um, it's my first time and I have to say, I don't know if there are any other, well, there are some Swedes in the room. Um, it's definitely my favorite Nordic uh, capital, I, I must say. And I just went to the Munch Museum on Sunday, which was fantastic. So uh, lovely to be here. Also fantastic to be in this uh, historical building. Um, and I think it's wonderful that you're using it to really tell the story of what happened, not just during the Second World War, but also with your new exhibition, uh, what are some of the, the dangers of racism and continued discrimination, even in a place like Norway today, that we should all be paying attention to. So thanks very much for Ellen to invite, for inviting me to uh, speak to all of you today. I really look forward to the discussion. I'm not an expert, of course, on Norway or Norwegian foreign policy, so I'm really hoping to hear from you what your thoughts are about what Norway can do and I would say not just in the Security Council, but also more generally at the UN, in the international system, um, but also perhaps at home, because that's an important part of the responsibility to protect and atrocity prevention is, is addressing discrimination um, at home as well. So let me start with atrocities, by which I mean the gravest human rights violations, namely genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. Atrocities are occurring around the world as we speak today. From Syria to Yemen, to the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Ethiopia, to Myanmar and Xinjiang. In all these cases, the international community has done very little to prevent or to respond to the calls for help of the victims. We've all seen the vivid images earlier this year of protesters in Myanmar holding up placards and calling for the United Nations and the international community to come to their aid, calling for the responsibility to protect. You might have all seen the images of T-shirts with R2P, placards with R2P. And sadly, of course, their calls have not been answered. Now, some people have said that this is a failure of the, the notion or the principle of the responsibility to protect. And I'd like to contend that principles don't fail. It's rather a failure of implementation, the lack of political will to engage in prevention and to take collective action when required. Now, turning to the impact of what has been termed the illiberal turn in the world order on atrocity prevention and perhaps human rights more broadly speaking, I agree with those who argue that we must be careful of drawing a clear distinction between a so-called high point or a heyday of human rights and the current era, and especially of framing it in terms of a decline of the West and the rise of the rest. In other words, the rules-based liberal order of which human rights and multilateralism are pillars is in crisis and therefore the respect for human rights, including atrocity prevention, is in decline. I'd like to remind us that the commitment to human rights by some Western states is not to be taken as a given. The leader of the Western world, the US, has contributed considerably to a decline in human rights over the past few decades, and not just under the recent presidency of, of Donald Trump. If we look at uh, the US's support or lack of support, perhaps, for human rights instruments, treaties related to international humanitarian law and human rights, uh, the treaty to ban landmines, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the selective criticism of human rights abuses in other states. Other supporters of human rights and atrocity prevention have also suffered damage to their moral authority through um, recent events. And again, in the US, we saw the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in Europe, we've seen criticism of the treatment of refugees, um, but also rising hatred and intolerance in many, many states who claim to be promoters of human rights and atrocity prevention. And at the same time, we know that states in the global south have been instrumental in promoting human rights and atrocity prevention, also historically. There's also evidence that human rights institutions and international law continue to expand. So just tempering this very pessimistic notion that you know, the end of human rights and atrocity prevention is, is nigh. Having said that, of course, there are very, very worrying trends. We're seeing a global deterioration of many of the indicators of resilience to persecution and vulnerability to identity-based violence. We're seeing that the breeding grounds for atrocity prevention are on, are on the rise. We see this with the rise of populism and nationalism and of authoritarian regimes. Increased discrimination against people based on their race, religion, ethnicity, gender. 
We're seeing a backsliding even in Europe on rights, not only the obvious ones in Hungary and Poland. And a very, very worrying trend is the rise in online hate speech and incitement to violence. At the international level, states like China are hard at work changing the narrative around human rights, focusing more on economic and social rights and emphasizing the sanctity of sovereign non-interference in what are seen to be the domestic affairs of states. So yes, there are challenges and there's no time for complacency. And an, as an international community, we should stand still and reflect on, what, on where we stand with the promise that was made after the Second World War and again after Rwanda, the promise of never again. Especially in light of the fact that in 2005, all member states of the United Nations made a commitment to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. And when most people think about the successes and failures of this promise that was made in 2005, or when they think about the, pro the successes and failures of atrocity prevention in general, they think about the Security Council. Now, this is problematic, and I might say something about this in the discussion, but of course, the topic for today is the Security Council, um, and so that's what I will be speaking to. Um, just in terms of how atrocity prevention fits into the work of the United Nations Security Council, we know that the Council's mandate, of course, is one of maintaining international peace and security, um, and the responsibility to protect, as outlined in the World Summit Outcome Document of 2005, places a special responsibility of, on members of the Security Council to uh, fulfill their obligation in protecting populations from these four crimes. Um, now, when there's a risk of a co commission of atrocity crimes or the crime has been committed, it's very likely this, this will have a destabilizing impact in neighboring countries and in the wider region whether it is a situation of conflict or not. So I think this is an important um, distinction to make, that of course the Security Council uh, is usually seen to be looking at situations of conflict, but we also know that atrocity crimes don't only uh, occur in situations of conflict, they can also occur in a uh, context where there's no conflict. And yet we know that atrocity crimes can also have a destabilizing effect, and of course that is what the Security Council should be interested in. Um, one could even say that atrocities, some, in some cases, lead to conflict. And I think the Syrian case is a case in point. And yet it remains sensitive, and we will hear this from foreign ministry officials, diplomats who are on the security. They will say, but it's very sensitive to talk about atrocity prevention, and particularly the responsibility to protect in council delib deliberations, and to even address situations from this perspective. And of course, there are many reasons for this, one of which is the, the ghost of Libya and the persistent misconception that the responsibility to protect is only about military intervention, particularly in the context of the Security Council. This, of course, misses the point that the core element of the responsibility to protect is the commitment to the prevention of the four crimes. Now, the Security Council approach, of course, is not generally a preventive one. And this is not just with regards to atrocity crimes, but also to other questions of peace and security. I think the Security Council, by nature, is a reactive body. Um, and so it really does not do prevention very well, even though we know prevention does not only save lives, but is also less costly in the long run. And these, of course, are considerations that uh, member states make. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, sometimes there's a, there's a misconception about how atrocity prevention relates to other agendas. And so, although, of course, it's an ongoing process that requires sustained efforts to build the resilience of societies to atrocity crimes through strengthening the rule of law, promoting human rights, managing diversity, etc., etc., all those things that build resilient societies and therefore forms part of the broader protection and prevention agenda, it's also different from these agendas because it has this very specific focus on the four atrocity crimes. Um, and there are a few other differences that I wanted to mention as well. And I think this is important in the context of thinking about Norway's position on the council because we know that Norway has a very particular set of priorities that it's committed itself to, um, which I'll get to just now. Um, one of those perhaps is uh, peace, uh, peacemaking or peace building, and within that, of course, other related agendas such as conflict prevention and conflict uh, 
resolution. But I want to make the point that it's, it's not enough to say that we're doing that and therefore by default we are contributing to the, um, pr to the prevention of atrocity crimes. Now why is this so? I want to start with conflict prevention. The prevention of armed conflict is not the same as preventing atrocities. While we know there's a strong link between conflict and the occurrence of atrocities, this is not always the case. So scholars like Alex Bellamy have shown that since 1945, 33% of mass killings did not occur in the context of armed conflict. Think about Stalin's Soviet Union, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. If we look at more recent history, there's the case of Venezuela, North Korea, Xinjiang, the war on drugs in the Philippines, the destruction of indigenous communities in Brazil. These are all situations where there is an allegation of atrocity crimes being committed in a context which is not one of war. And so atrocities uh, crimes are not always a result of war and can actually be a cause of violence, as I mentioned before. Another example is the violence in Yugoslavia, which was triggered, of course, by uh, decades of discrimination and uh, atrocity crimes and human rights violations. So that also means that atrocity crimes and atrocity prevention and conflict require different responses. So reducing instability will not automatically reduce the risk of atrocities. In other words, if your only aim is to uh, establish peace, to build peace, that might not have the required and the necessary effect on the prevention of atrocities. In some cases, reducing instability, which sometimes has the effect of consolidating power in one actor, can actually make atrocities more likely. For example, the worst atrocities of the Sri Lankan civil war actually took place in late 2008 and early 2009, when the collapse of the LTTE in the east and their increasing clear military defeat in the north stabilized the situation, right? So that would be seen as a good thing. But in fact, many atrocities took place in the stability that followed the war's end. The other difference between conflict prevention and atrocity prevention is that conflict prevention necessitates impartiality. And we hear this also in, in the Norwegian narrative, because of course Norway is known internationally as a peacemaker, uh, as a country which remains impartial and does not take sides. So this impartiality, of course, is important in trying to establish peace in a situation of conflict where you have to treat all parties to the conflict equally. But when you're trying to address or prevent atrocities, you have to make a distinction between victims and perpetrators. And that means taking sides. And so I want to pose the question to you. Can one be neutral and impartial in all situations? During the slaughter of the Tutsis, by the Hutus in Rwanda, during the Holocaust, during the massacre of Bosnian Muslims by Serbian soldiers in Srebrenica. There are clear limits to a consensual approach. The fact of the matter is that mass atrocity prevention and response requires taking uncomfortable positions and making difficult choices. For example, confronting governments that are suspected of committing mass atrocities. By promoting peace building, the assumption is that the end of the conflict will also lead, lead to an end of atrocities. As I just mentioned, in Sri Lanka, we saw the opposite. And relatedly, the assumption that democratization will result in peace ignores the fact that transition periods and elections can actually be triggering events for the commission of atrocity crimes. And here, I think Myanmar is a, is a clear example as well where there was too much emphasis placed by the international community on the democratic transition and where the very high risk of atrocity crimes was ignored. And then we saw uh, the, the commission of atrocities against the Rohingya in 2017 as a result. So my bottom line here is when one does not look at situations through an atrocity prevention lens, you can miss the warning signs. And what happened in South Sudan in 2013 or Myanmar in 2017 can be the result. The same can be said for many other well-intentioned uh, efforts. Um, I'm not going to mention protection of civilians here. We might talk about that later, but that's, of course, another focus area of Norway and the Council. And again, protection of civilians is an important, um, I think, 
uh, step. It's, Im it's important progress that's been made in the Security Council in uh, giving many of the peacekeeping missions a protection of civilians mandate. Protection of civilians, of course, forms part of the broader rubric of um, um, the responsibility to protect, but it's a small part because, of course, it only focuses on protecting civilians in the context of peacekeeping missions. And I think currently it applies to 14 peacekeeping missions. So what about all the other situations out there that are not covered by this? Um, so I think that's, that's uh, important as well. Of course, RTP also applies to all populations. It does not only apply to civilians. So under RTP, uh, we want to be preventing atrocities against everybody, not just civilians in, in situations of conflict. So getting to the question, what can a small state do on the Security Council? Now, I want to start off, I'm not going to talk about the challenges, perhaps some of the, the other speakers will be talking about the, the many challenges that small states face, uh, one of which, of course, is the lack of institutional knowledge and experience that the, the permanent five members who've been there since 1945, well, not in the case of China, but that have been there for a very long time, have built up over decades and decades. And so two years is actually a very short period to make a, make a difference, to have an impact. Um, and I think it's easier for some states than others. And I think Norway has, a, has an important position because it's seen as a credible voice with moral authority. Um, it has less baggage, perhaps, less skeletons in the closet. Um, it, it's perhaps been less of a target in terms of criticism of inconsistency or charges of hypocrisy um, that have been launched at other states, such as the US, the UK, or even more recently, Canada, of course. Um, and so I think this is an important kind of, call it a soft power resource that Norway can capitalize on. And so what is it that a small state like Norway can do when they're in the council? Well, of course, they have the power to set the agenda when they hold the presidency, which happens usually twice, so once a year on average um, during the two-year term. And this is when you can raise important issues and when you can emphasize agendas that you think are really important. Um, now, of course, we will hear that certain things cannot be raised because they're sensitive and there's always politics in the council, um, and this we know. And yet we have seen small states taking the lead on issues related to atrocity prevention in the Security Council. For example, we've seen Liechtenstein <coughs> emerging as a very strong advocate of international criminal justice. Um, we've also seen states like Liechtenstein advocating for a limitation on the use of the veto in cases of atrocity crimes. And you might be familiar, there are two initiatives that are related, the, the ACT initiative and the French-Mexican Mex initiative that essentially say, during when there's a situation of atrocity crimes and the council needs to take action, uh, states should refrain from using the veto. Um, so I think that is a really important initiative which, uh, which Norway should be continuing to promote. There are also informal methods. So there's um, the so-called ARIA formula meetings, which are informal meetings of the council. Um, and there have been a number of them on the responsibility to protect and atrocity prevention, such as on R2P and non-state actors. In 2015, this was hosted by Chile and Spain. Um, there was another one on the role of the Security Council in atrocity prevention by Poland, Belgium, Cote d'Ivoire, Kuwait, Peru, Peru, so again, small states. There was one on the relationship between the Security Council and the International Criminal Court, um, which was hosted by Bolivia, the Netherlands, and others. So there, these, this is one way in which, if it's, not, if it's not possible or seen as possible to get it onto the formal agenda of the Council, to have these informal meetings where, of course, not all the Council members are necessarily present, but it is an opportunity to raise perhaps more difficult questions. Um, there's also the importance, I think, that a country can play of simply putting, talking about the issue and simply saying that whenever you know, we're looking at the council in, at a particular country situation to ask the question, are we taking consideration, or are we taking into account the risk of potential atrocities in this situation? So beyond looking at a situation, whether it is um, you know, Ethiopia at the moment, which as, as we know is, is very difficult to even get on the agenda of the council. But are we looking at that situation not just from a humanitarian perspective 
or a conflict perspective, but actually saying, what is the risk of atrocities? And we know that the risk of atrocities is very high and very real. In fact, that atrocities have already been committed. So looking at it from that perspective, but ideally very early on, so that the risk factors can be identified and that early action, preventive action, can be taken. Um, and one of the ways in which to do that, some of it's simply procedural, right? So requesting that the council has regular briefings by the High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights and by my former office, the Office for uh, the Prevention of Genocide and the Responsibility to Protect, um, because these are the, the actors in the UN that have access to early warning on country situations with regards to human rights violations and are able to assess the risk for atrocity uh, crimes. So simply just getting more briefings by these actors in the council and not just always having people from um, uh, political affairs uh, who are concerned with elections and democratization from the Peace Building Commission, uh, the experts on counter-terrorism, right? Because of course that steers the agenda in a particular way. Um, Another, I think, uh, you know, important contribution would be to, um, again, insist on looking at atrocity prevention as an element when peacekeeping operations come up for their mandate renewal, right? So peacekeeping operations are usually mandated for a particular period. At some point, the question becomes, do we continue this peacekeeping operation in its current form? Uh, do we change it? Do we end it? And one of the questions that needs to be asked there is, what is this peacekeeping operation doing in terms of identifying risks to atrocity crimes? Are they, are they actually assessing for that? Are they monitoring it? Are they sufficiently able to protect populations in cases of risk of atrocity? So sometimes it's just a matter of asking the right question and making sure that that is on the table. Um, there's also the question, of course, of, you know, trying to push for a resolution on a country situation. For example, Ethiopia uh, is of course in the news right now, but there are a number of others where the answer might be, but we know that it's going to be vetoed. We know that it's going to be vetoed, whether it's, you know, uh, in the case of perhaps Myanmar, we know that it's China. In the case of Syria, it's Russia. So do we then just give up? And I think there's also questions around raising the political cost to other actors, including the P5, uh, of opposing resolutions that are aimed at preventing or stopping atrocities. So putting the resolution on the table, having a record of it, even when it means you know that that resolution is going to be um, vetoed. Then, of course, there's the question of structural prevention. So all of the things that the Council can be involved in um, through for example, chapter six um, uh, mechanisms in the charter, peacemaking, mediation, etc. These are all important things that I think play a role, but we have to ask the question, when these don't work, are we willing to move to more coercive measures, which of course include condemnation, sanctions, referral to the ICC, arms embargoes, and potentially the use of military force. So, perhaps most importantly, I think, what Norway can do and should do is to be the voice that says it's important to not just approach a situation like Ethiopia or Syria or Myanmar as a humanitarian crisis or a conflict, but to think about it in terms of the risk of atrocities, to apply an atrocity prevention lens both in terms of assessing the situation, but also considering the potential impact of various actions on the likelihood of atrocities. Now, Norway only has 14 months left on the Council, and while it remains essential to continue to engage the Security Council on questions of atrocity prevention, I also want to emphasize that greater involvement by other parts of the UN system is equally important. I would like to argue that we cannot leave a task as important as atrocity prevention to 15 states. We've seen other UN bodies taking action in the face of Security Council inertia, both the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council have created, for example, investigative mechanisms, and both bodies hold great potential for taking further action with regard to R2P. So I think here again is an emphasis on saying, you know, Norway should not feel that it's only now, during its term on the Security Council, that it can make an impact on atrocity prevention. That's absolutely not the case. 
Also, we should not only focus on the UN system, but look at how the responsibility to protect has been internalized and importantly operationalized by member states. Particularly, and we should particularly, I think, hold member states accountable to what they do and say at the UN and what they do at home. Because that's a really important element of atrocity prevention as well. And finally, while the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document placed the responsibility to protect firmly in the hands of states, we know that preventing and responding to atrocity crimes is a highly complex endeavor that requires collaboration from everyone who believes that no person should face the most heinous form of human rights violations based essentially not on what they have done, but on who they are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, thank you very much to Karen for a wonderful uh, keynote speech. Now, I have five minutes, so I'm going to be quick, and I'm going to adopt a somewhat different view. Now, Norway is a small state in the world, and it is becoming even smaller uh, as the years have gone by over the past decade. Now. For Norway, international law and a multilateral order has always been a strategic interest because that is how we manage to protect ourselves, and we also believe that that is how we are supposed to protect other small state and vulnerable groups. Now, during the 1990s and the 2000s after the Cold War, Norway participated quite vividly in order to strengthen international law uh, and in order to strengthen multilateral um, uh, organs. Now, over the past decades, particularly since 2014, but even perhaps going back to 2005 and 2008, these initiatives on the part of Norway has, has not been that visible. And uh, at the same time, multilateral cooperation has become more difficult. Now, Karen said that atrocity prevention is not about military intervention, and I very much agree with that. However, atrocities very often involve the use of force and ultimately invites, at the very end, the potential for military intervention. Karen also said, principles do not fail, politics do. I agree. I also agree that human rights obligations, they persist, as we speak, they will persist in the future. These are legal obligations on state on how they treat their own citizens. And we have uh, a system of international law today that persists, although the world is in a different state. The legal obligations to prevent atrocities, they also persist. Now, the challenge is that the world is in a different situation today. When you talk about atrocity prevention, we call on the UN Charter. Now, the objective of the UN Charter is to prevent war between states. This was the case up until 1990, when the Iraqi situation introduced the possibility for the Council to authorize the use of force to protect the Kurds from Saddam Hussein's regime. So this is when you kind of opened up the Charter to that type of, of prevention of atrocities with the use of military force. Now, during the 1990s and the 2000s, the development led in various directions. In Kosovo, there was an intervention in order to protect uh, the population from potential atrocities outside of the UN Charter. 
And in 2003, this was also used as an argument for the invasion in Iraq. Now, the backlash uh, from one perspective was in 2010, when the states of the world agreed that the crime of aggression under the International Criminal Court was equal to a manifest violation of the UN Charter. Now, what was the effect of this? The effect of this was two things. One thing that humanitarian intervention outside of the UN, UN system, outside of the UN Security Council decisions, was out of the question, which meant that the UN Security Council was given the task of authorizing the use of force and other means under, article, under Chapter 7 to prevent atrocities. Now, this coincided with an era of increasing uh, rivalry between major states in the world, China, Russia, and the US, with the European states partly participating as well. And I believe that what we are currently seeing with the lack of action on the part of the UN Security Council in particular has to do with this change of situation in the world. Because there is a Less, there is less willingness by the UN Security Council to act now because of the risk of conflagration of armed conflict between states. And this is still the main objective of the UN Security Council. The responsibility to prevent atrocities within states is still secondary to this overarching obligation. This is why I believe that there is, a, there is less willingness by the UN Security Council permanent member states to act. Uh, secondly, the Council is also caught up by this rivalry between the major states in the world, and that means that the UN Council is less able to act as well, because once you authorize uh, measures to prevent atrocities, you will inevitably uh, cause that to influence the political situation in the country. So basically, what will come out of the measures of preventing atrocities today will be a subject of political brin uh, uh, brinkmanship between the major uh, powers. So there is both a uh, decreased willingness to act and a decreased ability to act. Now, the problem is also linked to what Karen said about the nature of atrocity. Can you be neutral in a situation of atrocities? No, you cannot be neutral. And being non-neutral implicitly also means that you take sides. And taking sides in the world as it currently is, with the rivalry between the major states going right into the heart of the UN Security Council, is also perhaps what is preventing act, action by the UN Security Council on issues that are of great and grave importance for those caught up in these atrocities. So my analysis is somewhat different from Karen's, but it is overall in agreement with the legal duties to act. I believe that we are currently in a situation in the world where there is less ability and less willingness to risk both political gains, but also the risk of conflagration and war between major states in the world. And this is a more complicated um, hindrance than merely accusing the states of the world of being unable and unwilling because of their own political uh, ambitions. When the alternative is a more grave situation still, it brings a different light into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. I'm sure we will address in the discussion what the Security Council really can do, whether we are, maybe we're just barking up the wrong tree here. 
Angela Mouvumba Selström is our next discussant. She um, works as a researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala and um, will tell us a little bit about what Sweden did when Sweden held its Security Council seat. Um, as some of you might know, Sweden was a champion of the women, peace and security agenda. So I'm keen to hear from the Swedish perspective what a small state can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad everybody can hear me. I can hear myself. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege to be with you today, and I, I so enjoyed listening to Karen and also to Cecilia. I think that we, we have a lot of really interesting and complex ways of looking at the responsibility to protect, and there are many, many sort of unanswered questions from a research perspective about how Nordic countries can kind of navigate and move forward in these very difficult times. Um, and also to remember, I mean, standing here in this building and recalling the history of this building, um, why it's, it's so important, not just for the global south, where many of the sort of most vicious conflicts and mass atrocities are taking place, but also for the global north, for Europe. So I want to, um, I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I'm going to try to actually capture what Sweden did in its term in the UN Security Council, bearing in mind that women, peace, and security is, is ca qualitatively, categorically different from the responsibility to protect in terms of the political um, context and also a number of other issues. Um, but I also think there's some really interesting lessons. Um, when, when Karen was speaking earlier, I, I kept, I sort of am very taken up with this idea of the atrocity lens, looking at political situations through an atrocity lens and trying to understand the vulnerabilities that populations may, may be facing. Um, and that that is really what R2P offers us. I, I think that feminists and gender scholars will also make the strong claim that having a feminist lens or a WPS lens has been so important to advancing the women, peace, and security agenda at the UN Security Council. So there is real value in not losing conceptual clarity around R2P and replacing R2P with um, other more politically sort of uh, correct or, or comfortable lenses. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will be able to, that Nordic countries will be able to make tremendous progress on R2P by changing the lens. So what I'm talking about now will be, let's, let's kind of think about the Nordic um, approach in the long term. Um, think of it in a sort of a, 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 a more sort of advanced, gradual agenda. Because I think we all sort of agree that the Nordic countries do share a principled approach to the UN and to international law and to in, and human rights law. And there's this sort of principled approach does embrace the R2P agenda, but that the, cur the current illiberal order, the current kind of um, limitations in the UN Security Council prevent Nordic countries from kind of openly embracing and, and being activists around R2P. But that doesn't preclude them from laying the groundwork for preventing future mass atrocity. Um, so what I want to suggest is that w what Norway and other like-minded countries can do is build back R2P better. So the past, um, the Libya, the ghost of Libya, the 2011 situation, has come to haunt many R2Pers. <laughs> um, um, and the, and it, it shouldn't be underestimated that the Global South has really strong and valid reasons for doubting intervention. 
Um, and that the doubts are around the, the very fact that we all know that the rule-based international system is not really rule-based for all countries. So all countries are not alike. And that reality will not go away. But the Nordic countries have had a strong tradition of working quite well with and in support and, in sol and importantly in solidarity with principles of the UN with the Global South. So in solidarity around self-determination, um, being a very important kind of historical uh, linchpin. So I think that there is a real principled approach that the Nordic countries can take in dialogue and in partnership with the Global South, particularly with African countries, which, haven't, which didn't wholesale say that they want to throw away R2P, but that their real concern is the fact that this rule-based system and R2P can be used as an excuse, really, to take advantage of Global South countries, and that it's not applied consistently or fairly. Um, in the UN Security Council, uh, if we want to kind of zoom into that, uh, the UN Security Council is, a, is an incredible laboratory, I think, for elected member states to test out their political agendas. I think many elected states enter the council and they see it as an opportunity to shine on the global stage and to accrue uh, status. That kind of um, um, ambition is limited, I think. And I think that the Nordic states have begun to really, and a number of other elected states have begun to really reshape the way that they view their two-year memberships on the council as more than just sort of an opportunity to get individual status, but also an opportunity to build up the political capital, the power, the resourcefulness of the group of E10. And even though the group of E10, these elected 10 countries, that configuration changes over time, there is an increasing interest in and efforts, particularly, I mean, a good example is the South Africa-Sweden terms. Recently, they, they, they held um, joint meetings. There's now a, a, a process where there's a, a monthly meeting of the E10. Um, there are different ways in which the E10 group are trying to really build up their collective capacity, bearing in mind that they too have a kind of natural veto uh, if they want to use it, which they've, they've nev they never have. Um, so there's been, a, there's been a, quite a lot of um, promotion of Sweden's role in the council and its efforts to integrate women, peace and security into the council agenda. And I think that the lessons that we've had, we've done uh, a review of, of Sweden's time in the council with colleagues at, at PRIO, is that um, E10 countries have to navigate a couple of different criteria or choices. And these choices are around the capacities and the organization of their own ministries, how do they organize themselves, the working processes and institutional practices of the council. And we've heard about some of these, but these include, you know, the fact that the pen holdership, the, the process of drafting and, and organizing all debate on conflict case, conflict situations, um, that, that responsibility is really guarded primarily by the P3, by the UK, US, and France. Um, and uh, E10 countries don't really have an opportunity uh, to ho take the pen by, through chairing sanctions committees, through groups of friends, through managing council presidencies, um, uh, chairing subsidiary bodies, and informal methods, including um, horizon scanning, ARIA formula meetings, and working groups. And, and also working with the secretariat and leveraging the secretariat as a, as an, as a, a partner really in whatever agenda an E10 country will have. Um, and so, and the last kind of area I would really highlight are, of course, what we often think about when we think about the council, which is the interstate relationships. And the Nordic countries are particularly in a very good position, right? They're not beholding. Um, not all of them, um, to <laughs> not consistently to the P5. They have a, a level of independence that other elected countries don't have. Um, they also have very strong relationships with France, for example, through the European group, 
um, that that kind of relationship is very important. Um, and then they have relationships with the other elected elected 10 members. I think, again, I want to underscore the Nordic and African relationship as being very important. Um, and that this, this last criteria, I tend to raise it more when I'm thinking about the African states and the, as elected members because their dependencies around trade or aid, their other regional groupings, so exam for example, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, BRICS is, plays an important role. Um, they must first engage, also engage with those kinds of interstate relationships when they come into the council. So those also have a bearing in mind. Sweden had a uh, when it entered the council, it had entered the council already based on its feminist foreign policy. It already signaled a strong commitment to a feminist foreign policy. And I think we can only ask countries to perform in the council based on what they already sort of have positioned themselves to, to, to promote. So asking sort of what is Norway going to do about R2P also may, means that we have to also interrogate and think about what is what did Norway what has how has Norway positioned itself around R2P and not even just R2P internationally but I I think I'm going to kind of echo or highlight what Karen said but R2P also domestically how has it turned its on considered and integrated its own um, obligations as a state to protect its population um, against uh, atrocity crimes or hate crimes or everyday racism. And, and those kinds of thing, questions are also important in terms of establishing legitimacy and also credibility with African partners um, and African states. So again, here I'm, I'm hinting at the idea of building back R2P better, building back a kind of a, a more, a stronger faith and trust in this norm that has really taken a lot of um, hits over the last uh, 20, uh, over the last years. Um, so just going back to the navigation around these critical choices, I want to just highlight two examples. One, the role of the presidency. So uh, Karen mentioned that, you know, each member, elected state has two opportunities to preside over the council. Sweden made a, a speci specific decision not to use its presidencies to focus on WPS. And that seems a little bit counterintuitive. When I started this research, I thought, but of course Sweden would have used the presidency. That's when we'll see an uptick in WPS. But no, actually Sweden th felt using the presidency will kind of undermine its role as a president for the whole council. So it wanted to build trust within the council. And so it chose not to use presidencies for that particular signature theme. It did actually use a presidency for um, addressing prevent, con preventative action and con conflict prevention in the Gambia and using peace diplomacy. Um, but, but it didn't want to push its own particular kind of what some other countries might think of a parochial interest onto the agenda. It did rely on its allies, other E10 states, to raise the hand and ask, where are the women? Um, what about sex de disaggregated data? How did you, uh, asking secretariats uh, and briefers to uh, report on gender? But it didn't prioritize that. And instead, it really tried to build in WPS throughout all of its daily work, the everyday work, the work with getting, you know, making sure there were, there was gender parity in briefing, um, making sure that their voices of civil society briefers was present on the council in briefing, um, working with um, the informal expert working group where countries often go to get their first sort of lens on WPS on a specific country theme. Um, negotiating with the pen holder, with the UK, behind the scenes about particular language in a resolution and where it should be placed and if it's operative and if it's really practical and concrete and implementable. 
And it found, Sweden found, that by using this approach, there was almost very little pushback because it would be hard to argue with making WPS just kind of normal everyday business. Um, it's hard to argue with the principle, right, of making sure that women, peace, and security is addressed. And so my, my thought is that elected states, Nordic states, and elected states in general can have a similar approach of kind of more or less normalizing atrocity prevention incrementally, gradually, and hopefully um, building back better. Sorry to use that term, but I think we all know what we mean by that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Angela, for um, pointing to some of the things that might be possible to do. Uh, our next discussant is uh, Christopher Liden from the Peace Research Institute. He is an expert in uh, ethics and international relations and international humanitarian law. So um, being a scholar of the ethics of all this, I guess maybe you can tell us not only what we could do, but also what we should do. Please, Christopher. Thanks a lot, and um, if not an expert, I'm a lifetime student of, uh, of these uh, subjects, and uh, I really appreciated uh, your, your address, uh, Karen. I thought it was extremely balanced, and I, I think it's hard to kind of find something to, to uh, arrest you on or to challenge you on, but I'll do, I'll do my best. And also the comments from Cecilia and Angela, uh, I think, were very complimentary. I, I'll take you a few steps up in the sky as a philosopher into some, some, some broader uh, abstractions away from the concrete everyday debates at the UN Security Council that we're interested in today. And uh, up there, uh, just to show my kind of very basic cards, I have uh, a, a sort of typology of different approaches to the politics of ethics and law in international affairs. And the, those cards are called realism, internationalism, and cosmopolitanism. And depending on which of these three perspectives you come to this question with, you will get a very different uh, answer and conclusion. So I'm interested in, in, in how underlying assumptions about the nature of norms and law in international affairs affect these sorts of discussions. Now, um, jumping directly into the question of what to do with this question of uh, uh, atrocity prevention, how to promote it in, in the Security Council, and how to potentially then build R2P back better. I'm, I guess you're all familiar now with the, the notion of responsibility to, to protect and that history. So I'll, I'll skip that and abbreviate it as R2P again. And uh, in, my, in my reading, uh, R2P is like the League of Nations of uh, the field of atrocity prevention. It's something that uh, unfortunately uh, failed. It failed over Libya in not hindering that the agenda of R2P and the related protection of civilians agenda was abused by NATO and, uh, and for, for, the, for actions that were not in line with the uh, resolution that was uh, in the name of this responsibility. And also it failed utterly over, the, uh, over uh, Syria, the failure to actually uh, responding in, uh, in an effective uh, manner to the massive atrocities uh, in Syria. So with a very imperfect parallel, this would, Libya and Syria would sort of be the World War II of the League of Nations, where things collapsed and where it leaves us with an enormous gap in terms of how to grapple with this, how to rebuild something after this moment. And we could call it, you know, building R2P back better, but my advice 
from my kind of reading of this situation and the status of R2P and protection of civilians is that one should do that without actually using the, no, uh, the notion of R2P and without then also using the kind of way that R2P norm has been institutionalized in the UN system. It ne we need to use this gap as uh, an opportunity for building a more concerted response to the question, okay, so there are still, there's still this problem of at mass atrocities. How do we deal with that in the way that takes the history of R2P into account and where we can build a sort of uh, basis for more effective responses? Okay, so that's very abstract, but the um, answer to that partly lies in the everyday work on the UN, uh, UN Security Council, but also in all the other bodies that are relevant for, for responses, and also in uh, keeping states responsible outside of the UN Security Council. As Karen alluded to, when we talk about situations like Ethiopia now as kind of a humanitarian disaster and as a conflict, we, uh, we lose the the element that's associated with uh, atrocity prevention and the atrocity response. And we also somewhat uh, expect the pr problem to be solved by the UN Security Council and by international humanitarian organizations, or by a kind of a humanitarian agenda by states, as we saw it played out in also humanitarian diplomacy of responses to Syria. Kind of there was this political field of humanitarian responses in Syria that of course uh, did not solve the problem, although it alleviated some of the, some of the suffering. So I'm worried about how this shift towards a kind of humanitarianization of these settings have uh, alleviated states from some of the responsibility for actually uh, taking action. Um, and that's not that, that's, as far as I see, that should not be done through coercive interventions, military interventions, without UN Security Council mandate. But there's this huge political uh, space between inaction or just kind of formalistic uh, state statements and uh, military intervention. But when we then think about how to kind of rebuild the uh, normative framework of uh, atrocity prevention and response, the field that Karen so uh, wonderfully laid out, um, we need to remember that it's not kind of the worst atrocities throughout history, although there were very, very um, grave, have not been Rwanda and Srebrenica and the, 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 the kind of atrocities of the 90s that formed some of many of these debates and that evolved into the R2P agenda. But the, the, those atrocities have been related to, partly to uh, world wars, massive interstate warfare, and partly to totalitarian regimes. So the solution to atrocity response cannot be to alienate uh, totalitarian regimes from this agenda or to do it in a way that makes, uh, that, that for instance just builds on the support of uh, US, UK and France on the council and that kind of works around Russia and China. Russia and China needs to be part of this uh, solution and the countries that are, um, that are associated with, with opposition to the liberal world order, right? So that's uh, an incredibly difficult balancing act. But if we think kind of the history from the Cold War and to this uh, R2P agenda that evolved, it could be described as a, a move from a realist world order where law and norms of international affairs were bracketed as soon as they kind of uh, were interfering with the uh, conflict between uh, the East and the West. Um, 
a move from that sort of realistic setting and into a cosmopolitan setting, where it was not the uh, sovereignty of states, but the interests and the rights of individuals that would define this normative scope for, uh, for international or multilateral action. But in between realism and cosmopolitanism is the good old internationalist field. And there was internationalism during the Cold War, an aspect of it. And there was also internationalism during that kind of cosmopolitan time of the 1990s and early 2000s. And that's where we need to find the solution. And in that internationalism, one are you know, left with a reliance on having the sovereign states on board and not bracketing the sovereignty of states in order to promote a certain ideal, uh, a certain political ideal, like a liberal, uh, democratic political order. But there is no contradiction between a state-based, sovereignty-based uh, international system and the promotion or advancement of human rights and democracy and a liberal agenda. Because that internationalist framework is what actually facilitates that advancement. So it's a misunderstanding that you will have to go kind of cosmopolitan in, in order to be liberal or advance uh, human rights and democracy in the international system. So that's kind of uh, where I see the room for, uh, for thinking of how to replace R2P with a new and more concerted way of addressing this. But the most important responses, the most important measures are the kinds that happen on an everyday la uh, uh, level without, the, um, without the necessarily alluding to a specific kind of overarching principled uh, agenda. And there one, one can learn from the uh, story of uh, protection of civilians, which emerged as a sort of a slogan. It emerged as a rather lean agenda. And then it turned into a much more operational thing. It turned into a, a, a huge catalog of the various instruments that one have, has at one's hands in uh, advancing the protection of civilians while doing peacekeeping, while doing humanitarian operations, while doing all the things that international actors uh, are doing in conflict settings and in, yeah, in, in settings where protection of civilians is relevant. I would not suggest uh, to rely on protection of civilians as a new kind of overarching frame for atrocity prevention because also protection of civilians has not really been set up for that, uh, for that purpose. But it's uh, the, the way that uh, OCHA has had a role in systematically building this catalog, and it's uh, sort of written down in this uh, AIDS memoir, which has expanded into something which is, uh, you know, covers lots of different fields. Uh, is something that one could think of doing uh, something similar within in this field. Okay, so that's my few cents, and then I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you all of you for excellent uh, remarks. I'm um, keen to start with 
Angela's challenge of building R2P better. Karen, what are your initial thoughts on that? I thought you were answer, asking a question to Angela, so I'm confused. Um, well, I mean, I think it was interesting to listen to Angela and then listening to you, because of course you, you were taking the different view, and I think this, this, this relates to a debate that is ongoing in the, call it the atrocity, community, atrocity prevention R2P community, whether what we should be doing is focusing more on R2P or whether we should kind of shelve R2P and try something else. Um, and to be honest, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm ambiguous about that because I see the value in both approaches. And, and so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I absolutely agree with you, Christopher, that you know, it, the, the importance is, is the content, right? So the importance is what we do. We want to be pre preventing atrocity crimes and where necessary, responding to them when they are happening. So that is the bottom line. What we call that, um, doesn't really matter. And so in that sense, it's not so important to refer to something like the responsibility to protect, to rebuild it, uh, or to revitalize it, or, or whatever. Having said that, I think, um, Christopher, in, in, in your talk, you were also mentioning the fact that the developments in, um, in, in the world today have also kind of shifted this responsibility away from states, so this focus on a kind of humanitarian approach have shifted the responsibility away from states, and in a sense, states use that as an excuse not to really fulfill their responsibility. So I think in that sense, again, emphasizing the responsibility to protect as something which states committed themselves to in 2005 remains important. And so I think, if I can remain a fence-sitter, I think it's a little bit of both. And I think it's really about you know, thinking about what works in which context. And so I think it's important um, yes, to do what we can, whatever we call it, uh, to prevent atrocities, but at the same time, I think the responsibility to protect remains a really important political instrument, also for victims of atrocities. And, and, and speaking to people in places like Myanmar, they see it as an more important political instrument that they can go to their governments and say, but you signed up to this agreement in 2005, and to say to other states, but you committed to doing something, taking a uh, collective action. So I think that would be my answer. Cecilia, it looks like you're thinking <laughs> you have something to say. No? I'll eventually get to it, thank you. You'll get to it. I'm, um, I was also curious to hear uh, Christopher's um, argument that the humanitarian perspective may actually kind of, I might be simplifying now, but um, so please feel free to collect me, correct me, but that a humanitarian perspective may actually kind of stay in the way of the f a focus on atrocity prevention. Um, I don't know if any of you would like to comment on that. Cecilia, perhaps humanitarian law is your field. What's your, your thoughts on that? reflecting on what I was going to say next. <laughs> so can you just repeat the question? This issue of humanitarianism has maybe sometimes been in the, in the way of thinking about the trust and acting on atrocity prevention. Yeah, I, I very much share uh, Christopher's uh, uh, analysis. However, I, I, I believe that this, there is a double issue at hand. Now, on, one, on the one hand, there is this humanitarianism that shifts the responsibility away from states, which I also think is very, very negative, uh, because th ultimately this is a responsibility that, that lies with the states, mm -hmm. uh, and we should be very clear about that. Now, I think that the second uh, challenge is that humanitarianism has this tendency of detaching itself completely from, from politics as well. And I think that is a dangerous development because it, it kind of, it, it gives the impression that humanitarian action in the midst of uh, a tense conflict where there is major political battles going on is somehow unpolitical in a way that it is not abused and used in political ways. And that is also, to some extent, reducing the challenges of the humanitarian 
uh, actions. And I think that a, a combination of these things saying that yes, humanitarian action is also has political effects, but it does not remove the responsibility of the states, even though it is political and even though it goes against your political objectives in this particular setting. So I think that there is this, there is this challenge of, of detaching humanitarianism from the responsibility of the state and from the political effects that it is having, because this is the reality, and this is also, to some extent, preventing the states from assuming this responsibility, because the states are basically saying, you are calling this neutral, but in effect, it has a lot of political effects. So how to kind of combine those two in a more appropriate way, I think, is important. Uh, and having followed, for instance, the, 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 the conflict in Yemen, this is also a problem because all types of humanitarian action will have a political effect. And this is one of the main reasons why the, the, the states involved are saying uh, no. So it's kind of combining this dimension of real political effects, but this does not relieve the states of the obligation of, of providing humanitarian action. Christopher, any comments? No, just I've, I've been wondering humanitarian circles lately and seen enormous frustration with the principle of neutrality there because they feel that they are the ones that are responsible for really addressing a situation like Myanmar and currently Ethiopia, and that they feel kind of helpless because of their, uh, because they're supposed to remain uh, neutral. Uh, of course, that's, that's still a minority position, but strong voices uh, in the ICRC and other places kind of see that as a main, uh, as a major concern, that they are the, sort of supposed to be the solution and still they're helpless by having to be neutral in those kinds of settings where it's so obvious that one side, like in Syria with the Assad regime, was responsible uh, for uh, extreme kind of uh, atrocities, uh, similar with the new authorities in Myanmar and, and um, the, uh, in, in now in Ethiopia, the um, uh, hindrances from the, from the authorities in access to Tigray and so on. So, um, but, but that's a symptom of the fact that too much expectation lies to the role of the humanitarian organizations in actually being the solution to these uh, problems. It's, it's part of the solution. So it's wrong to set it as an either or, or and it might be you mutually reinforcing after all. But I think it's still a, a development that one needs to be aware of, that one should not just kind of reframe the whole situations as humanitarian crisis, where you will kind of resolve it through a humanitarian response bound by these principles of neutrality, impartiality, independence and, uh, and humanity. Um, that said, uh, I just want to note that I, I realize that my point on kind of building uh, or replacing the R2P agenda with something else, filling that gap was basically exactly what Angela already said when talking about building back better. It's just a kind of disagreement about whether we should use the label of R2P. And I think uh, using that label, you know, you're on the fence, but I would suggest that you would then follow the spirit of Angela's intervention, <laughs> but uh, follow my advice to skip the notion because it's a provocative concept in national affairs currently. It's counterproductive as far as I see to, to keep using that term. Uh, so, um, yeah. And also if there are questions from the audience, please just feel free to raise your hand. Um, Angela, going back to Sweden a little bit, you noted in your um, comments that, of course, the women, peace and security agenda is very different from R2P. But there was also perhaps an expectation when, you, when Sweden campaigned for the Security Council seat that it would be controversial, actually, that this feminist foreign policy uh, wouldn't necessarily be accepted by all. 
But also, I think there is a difference in terms of a national constituency for the agenda. Uh, I think that might, in many ways, be uh, lacking in Norway. There are no sort of huge uh, NGOs uh, doing advocacy around R2P principle, for example, holding the government accountable on what it's doing in Myanmar or Ethiopia or whatever. So, uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of a nat national constituency for for a Security Council agenda. I, I, I will, but I will make one little fact. I, don't, I know we don't want to devolve into a discussion about do we keep the R2P language oh, or not. We want to. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting. But I, I also, I'm not 100% behind the idea of continuing to use the language. So I was, when I was referring to the phrase R2P, building back better, it really is about the content of R2P, building back a better approach, um, building consensus within the nations of the, secure, of the UN, um, building a sort of a following amongst civil society and populations around the norms, which I think you know, there are these kind of waves and, and, and I think we really have experienced a, a number of really enormous shock waves for the last 20 years which have altered the way in which people trust in institutions, trust the UN, um, you know, all of these things. That, so I do think there needs to be a, um, a kind of concerted effort to say we're going to try to build back you know, a better consensus, a shared vision and trust between the global south and the global north. And it could be that you don't use the term R2P to do that, but you could still refer to the pillars of R2P and the content of R2P. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, yes, so I just wanted to, to, to clarify. Um, and, and in terms of this civil society and the sort of the con national constituency, um, with regards to women, peace, and security, you have both, uh, you have a tremendous wave of um, civil society organizations in the global south, women's groups, uh, women's in um, networks, uh, all of which have contributed to the WPS agenda have been real vanguards of the WPS agenda from pushing for Security Council Resolution 1325 to advocating and lobbying with the African Union, um, all kinds of, 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 war, of types of civil society engagement. You also have a similar engagement in Europe and in the Nordic countries. So Sweden had was able to actually convene various kinds of configurations of civil society organizations um, that were both sort of to, to kind of come up with ideas and concrete suggestions uh, around the, the Security Council membership, but also to, to sort of act as, as watchdogs in a way. I mean, it's, it was not a very contentious relationship between the state and civil society in Sweden. But you would have, you know, large groups of, of umbrella organizations um, working with uh, civil society in Africa, for example, um, that would propose ideas and propose concrete recommendations for how to address the, the situation in Yemen, how to make sure that women are part of the negotiating process in Yemen, or how to... Uh, uh, address the fact the conflict related sexual violence in the DRC or you know all these issues have have a real really diverse I mean really diverse group of civil society organizations behind them and then you also have um, a similar kind of configuration but much more sort of UN focused in New York with UN related uh, institutions, you also have the NGO working group, um, you, you know, on women, peace and security, and also the sort of New York policy uh, 
group of, of actors like the International Peace Institute or Security Council report that are much more sort of impartial and tech technocratic, but also provide a, a platform for exchanging ideas and documentation and reporting and, and policy research. And, and this is a vast, I mean, to me, it's a really vast, complicated, crowded field, actually. If you want to work on women, peace, and security now, it's a crowded field of, of actors. Um, and they, they all have, I think they give, a, they make the hand of an elected member quite strong. It's, it, it, they enable the elected member to find solutions, practical solutions to get timely, relevant information. Um, that isn't only one kind of information. I mean, there's various competing ideas and advocacy positions. So I think it, it's really been important for the WPS agenda. And, and Sweden also, with a feminist foreign policy, signaled quite early on what it was going to pursue. And it was the first country in the world with a feminist for, foreign policy. And at first, I think, every, I think Margot Wallström says everybody laughs and everybody you know, calls you crazy, but eventually everybody agrees with you. Um, and I think that that's really what um, was important. It was a surprising um, calling card. It, I think it allowed other countries in the Security Council and other countries in the UN General Assembly to understand and to place Sweden's position and principles. And I think that that sort of clarity is actually of benefit. Um, it, I think initially when I started, my colleagues and I started looking at this, we thought that um, having that kind of clarity would be uh, a handicap, a negotiating handicap. But I, I think if you get elected and, and they know why you're coming there and what you're going to do, then they, they can understand why you raise your hand every five minutes and say, where are the women? What about women, peace, and security? They'll understand it, and eventually they'll start to work with you on it. To stop you raising your hand, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cecilia, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to also have a, a comment on the issue of moving away from uh, responsibility to protect the, the use of the, the, the concept. Now, I belong to those who was has always been quite critical of uh, responsibility to protect because it, it purports to, to be a new legal principle, which it isn't. It's based on already existing legal obligations. Mm -hmm. And then it adds a political doctrine, which is basically about expectations about what states should do and what institutions should do. Mm. And if you manage to maintain that distinction, then it's a good, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, principle to use because I think that it is to some extent changing the emphasis. And I really want to emphasize that we should not over um, uh, emphasize the effect of the Syrian quagmire, the Syrian catastrophe, because I think that, <laughs> the, let me take you back to 2012. I was part of this um, international network of legal scholars who were reviewing the potential for a military intervention in Syria. This was in the autumn of 2012 and the spring of 2013, and every intervention would lead to a major regional and potentially global war. So at the time, this was not really a way to, 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 to act. Now, if you look at the situation from 2014, uh, 2013 actually, when the UN Security Council acted to, to remove chemical weapons from Syria, under the council with the Russians and the Chinese working together with the Americans and the Europeans. Then in 2014, when the Americans went back to Iraq and Syria with military force in order to, to stop the, 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 the genocide of the Yazidis in part, and they also needed to go into the, to the Syrian part of the territory. The process for this was not a UN Security Council resolution, but it was a UN Security Council meeting where the US president was heading the meeting, the Russians and the Chinese were there. Two hours before the meeting, the US started to bomb in Syria with no authorization. Nobody raised a word. This is implicit acceptance by the 
the Chinese and the Russians, that the US can be there and they can do this. And it also has a strong dimension of protection in it. The year after, the Russians did exactly the same thing in the council. And you have had also authorization of, you know, when, when in 2014, in January, and then uh, in the summer, and every consecutive year after this, the UN Security Council has authorized um, humanitarian aid into Syria, not via Damascus. And the Russians, they have been on board on this. Well, they haven't been on board. Every time, it's a very long process of negotiation because this is, this is something that the Russians are doing despite that they are supporting the Assad regime. They are doing this against the will of the Assad regime every year. And, and, and I think it's very important to recognize that also the Russians, at least in the Middle East, and to some extent also the Chinese, they are also making political um, uh, sacrifices in the way that they are approaching these situations in the Security Council. And I very much want to emphasize what Christopher said. You cannot <laughs> uh, start to, 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 to think that you will aid humanitarianism and prevention of atrocities by alienating those powerful actors that you need to have on board on their responsibility to protect, coming back to, my, to, to, this, to this definition again, because that is a shared uh, obligation. And my impression is that both the Russians and the Chinese accept this responsibility, but there is a disagreement about when when does it actually go from being a, something that you can do to something that you are obliged to do? But I think, and this is coming back to the issue of responsibility protect, I do think that it is a useful uh, word to use in order to remind everyone that there is a political expectation, and ultimately behind this, there is a legal obligation, and that is a legal obligation on all states, irrespective of political orientation and, and uh, what have you. Uh, there is, I think, a question from, um, yeah, we have two questions from the audience. Helen, while we're waiting for the question, I would also be interested to hear from other audience members, I don't know if that's going to be part of the question, but what your expectations are of Norway on the council. What were you, what were you thinking when you heard that Norway was becoming a Security Council member? What did you think or hope that Norway was going to do? I'd be really interested in hearing, not being a Norway expert myself, but um, yeah. <laughs> It's a hard question to uh, jump into, um, but um, but maybe uh, building on that, what I wanted to go back to is the question of natural uh, national constituencies and also national capacity. Um, so this question also goes back to uh, to you, Karen, and perhaps you can uh, help me out uh, a bit, Ellen, as well, because um, uh, just just noting firstly with. When it comes to national constituency as well, it's it's it's, an, it's interesting that we have so many NGOs working on the content of of R2P. Um, although and and that taken in mind that the concept hasn't really uh, isn't something that really engages uh, NGOs in Norway. So maybe there's something to work with there. I don't know. But my question goes to national co uh, capacity when it comes to integrating atrocity prevention, um, because. Um, uh, you know this much better than me, Ellen, but my impression is that Norway has quite a low capacity when it comes to uh, applying an atrocity prevention lens uh, in its foreign policy, but also absolutely in its domestic pol policy. And uh, there exists a global network of R2P focal points, uh, which are high-level government officials uh, working specifically with the responsibility to protect. Uh, and as far as I know, Norway doesn't uh, have one. Both Sweden and uh, and Denmark do, but Norway doesn't. So, so uh, my question for you is: Is that a good idea? Is that something we should uh, have? And um, how would that help? Okay, we'll we'll take another question um, over here. Please uh, let us know who you are and give your question. Van this was the most enlightening session. Um, I thought that in my ripe old age, I wouldn't learn too much about this, but I have. 
Thank you so much. I have two minor observations, which, which you would like to comment on. One is the fact that uh, it seems to be a new ambivalence about the idea of human rights. When we say right to protect, most people have a clear-cut opinion of what it means. What we see now, for example, the Russians argue in favor of their role in Ukraine on the basis of human rights. They protect minorities. So this underscores over and over again the importance of discussing the arguments, the philosophical and political basis of human rights. So far, we have taken this basis for granted, but and this follows up on um, the idea that we should not exclude, or we try not to exclude authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, but simply debating with them when they try to use or abuse the idea of human rights. One of my students went to, it, uh, to the United States and she met Chinese diplomats. They spoke faultless Norwegian. They knew exactly what the Norwegian government were thinking about when it came to human rights. We are faced with intellectual and philosophical resources in these regimes, which we shall not underestimate. How do you react? That's my first observation. My second observation is, the gentleman from Prio said that democratization may not mean peace. On the contrary, democratization may involve higher risk for violence. What strikes me is that we know too little about the people and the concrete historical empirical conditions in the country that we confront. For example, Norwegian government, Norwegian officials tried to make peace in South Sudan, underestimated the evil, the wickedness of the leaders. How much, no, how much did we know about Libya? Did we have any idea of who the actors were? It simply strikes me over again that we, can, we need more concrete empirical knowledge about conditions in each country before we even start discussing our end to. This may be slightly trivial, but I think it's quite consequential. Thank you. Um, Christopher, first, I think you raised your hand before we had a question, so I'll let you respond to this first, and then we'll move on to Karen. Okay, so, so thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I'll leave the, the question of uh, national constituencies and, uh, and the structure of, of national focal points to you. Uh, on, um, on the question of uh, the scope for um, debates and scope for arguments in the, also then in the Security Council, um, I think there's, to, to a certain extent, there is a, a a scope for that sort of uh, challenges. For, so Russia, will, when they argue that they protect uh, civilians in, in Ukraine uh, and protect the minority, they, they kind of draw on a certain principle language and one can, uh, one can uh, push back against that. But uh, when it comes to, you know, these, these debates happen uh, at so many levels and what you see at the council in the council debates is kind of the generally the end result of uh, lengthy consultations there you can have you can have and Karen would be know much more about this than me but you can have debates in in the in the informal kind of back rooms and various processes uh, behind the scenes but I think a more inter uh, the most interesting way to read the arguments that are made in the council is to read how they are uh, a reflection of the strategic interests of the states uh, in the specific situations like Ukraine and how they uh, draw on principles then like protection of civilians or responsibility to protect 
principles that are then consequential in the uh, respect of structuring this debate. So while it wouldn't necessarily work to say, well, what you say there, your argument doesn't, uh, it's, it's not logical, it doesn't, it doesn't hold, it's not a valid argument. But, if, but these debates on the principles, they still form the scope for that sort of uh, uh, arguments that are being put forward. So um, that, that, that brings me to uh, what I think is a fundamental insight uh, on this whole dis discussion on protection and why that uh, matters or is possible at the UN Security Council is that all the veto uh, powers have a, f have a strong self-interest in a normative language that they can use when it's in their interests, but they can also violate it when it's not, through the, the, through the veto. So this gives an influence on the developments of the domestic affairs. It creates a lot of uh, power in the bilateral relations to countries that are involved in the specific uh, situation uh, on the council because they can juggle this normative language. So that's also why one needs to be very, a lot is at, at stake in the formulation of norms and in pushing back, even if pushing back against the Russian diplomat on the council in that very debate would not necessarily take you anywhere. Pushing back in the public and, uh, and in larger debates on these things uh, are consequential. So understanding the underlying kind of power politics of this uh, language, I think, is very important. Um, you got... Sorry, yeah. just on, on democratization. So democratization is generally correlated with uh, peace. So uh, one should uh, clearly not uh, see democratization as somehow leading to more war. There's a lot of uh, research on that, but uh, democratization is also not a guarantee for peace. So, yeah. Yeah, and transitional phases may be particularly dangerous. Um, Karen, you got a couple of challenges here from the audience. One is how to deal with totalitarian, authoritarian states, of course. The other one, going sort of to the other end of the scale, is, is this issue of uh, focal points and nat national constituencies. And even um, from the audience asked the question about Norway. Um, yeah, of course, they're not here to defend themselves, so <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be too harsh in my description of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but I think it's fair to say that the capacity of, on atrocity prevention is not uh, their major strength. Um, it's, uh, I mean, Norway is strong on peace diplomacy, humanitarian affairs, etc., but atrocity prevention has not been um, a field that the Norwegian uh, foreign affairs has focused on. And I think we unfortunately see, uh, partly at least see the results of that in Norway's policies towards Myanmar, for example. Um, and so this, and you're right that Norway does not have uh, an RTP focal point, which would be like a person uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, particularly uh, having a responsibility to raise these questions of atrocity prevention. So, Karen, um, what do you think could be could that be useful, or or maybe not? Yeah, maybe I'll start with that question. And I think, um, I mean, you mentioned that these focal points are usually based in ministries of foreign affairs, right? And we see that. So there's about 60 of them worldwide. So in 60 different countries, there are these focal points. And the whole idea is that they are this, this one person at relatively senior positions within a government ministry. And like I said, usually in ministries of foreign affairs, who then try to kind of coordinate the national response to... Uh, situations in other countries, specifically around um, atrocity prevention. So again, this person who goes to a meeting, whether it is on you know development assistance or whether it is on conflict prevention, and asks this question, right? So again, going back to what I said earlier, this is what we need: somebody in the room to be asking the right questions about you know have you thought about this in terms of atrocity prevention? 
Um, having said that, so I think these, you know, these focal points are, are a really good idea. They work very well in some cases, less well in others. And as usual, it often has to do with individuals. So it really is you know, about their knowledge, their interest in the subject, um, how much time they're willing to spend, because of course they're doing this alongside their normal job, uh, reaching out to others and, and, and really promoting this idea. Um, I think one of, the, one of the limitations of the current system is that, that they tend to focus on foreign affairs. And so I think, uh, I mean, I think your question was also a little bit related to, you know, what is, what should be the domestic kind of capacity building process of thinking about, you know, what is the risk? And I think, I think we can all say that the risk in Norway of, you know, uh, mass atrocities is probably quite low, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be paying attention to and addressing the risk factors that we can identify, because we know that Europe is not immune to risks, right? This, this, this building is a testament to that, and not so uh, you know, um, distant events uh, in Europe, of course, uh, have, have also pr proven this to us. And so, I mean, you know, if you haven't been to this exhibition in this, in this uh, institution ab about racism, everyday racism in Norway, I think you should go and take a look at that. And so the question is, how do we relate that to Norway's commitment at the international level to protect, remember, first and foremost, the, the R2P is about protecting populations in your own country. So it's about building national mechanisms to do that and connecting it to foreign policy um, priorities, right? And of course, those of you who study foreign policy know that there's always this, this debate about the foreign should be connected to the domestic, right? So these two should not be two separate things. So it's not about, you know, constantly being on the lookout of, oh, what are the risks in other countries for atrocities? It's firstly starting at home. And I think this becomes so important, particularly for a state like Norway, which, as I've said, you know, has this kind of moral authority as being, uh, you know, leader of peace, etc. And we've seen how quickly a reputation like that can become tarnished and can be held against states when their own house is not in order. And I mentioned some of the examples uh, earlier. So I think it's really, really important for Norway to kind of look inward firstly and say, what are some of the problems we're experiencing here in terms of everyday racism, discrimination, treatment of refugees, etc.? And then we can start thinking about what do we do about this um, externally. And that can take many forms. So some countries have national atrocity prevention plans that they've actually developed. Um, and these are usually interministerial plans, so where lots of people get together and, and, and think about how to do this. Um, as I said, the focal points is one, is one such, I guess, mechanism to try and, and get this going. Um, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be started from within other institutions, such as this one, such as national human rights institutions, for example. Um, so absolutely, I think that's a really important question. And of course, should I mention that uh, Evan wor used to work at my old office in the UN, so very glad to, so, so he, he himself is already a, I mean, uh, a resource, I think, in terms of thinking about these issues, both in the Norwegian and the, and the international context. Um, yeah, to the question, I wanted to just also touch on the, the question of democratization. And I, yeah, I mean, I also, you know, I didn't want to imply that democracy leads to atrocities, but there is a risk that the process of democratization can also, of course, lead to atrocities. So I think that's, that's important to establish. We know that in terms of the risk factors that can lead to atrocities, or perhaps the opposite, right? What do we do to build resilience against the potential risk. We know that democracy is, is one of those things. So having a democratic society with all of the things that should come with that in terms of tolerance, um, rule of law, uh, human rights institutions, and all of that, of course, are strong building blo blocks to resist um, uh, the potential for atrocity crimes. But I absolutely agree with you that you know this kind of one-size-fits-all approach to democracy clearly has not worked, or to building peace. And I think Afghanistan is just the most recent example of that, right? Where we really, as an international community, need to rethink um, what models we have in our head that we think apply universally, and that, of course, do not. Um, and so this, this kind of context-specific knowledge that you talked about is so important, also in the atrocity prevention uh, uh, community. Um, and so I think you know th this is taken very seriously by the, all the researchers I know, but also by the UN office. 
that of course we can learn lessons from other examples, but those lessons cannot just be transferred automatically in terms of, okay, so we saw this risk factor here, that led to you know, uh, this situation, this is how we are able to respond. Uh, those things don't all add up uh, in different contexts. So I think on the one hand, of course, you have to draw from uh, lessons, and I think research is so important. So the more we learn about uh, you know, the risk factors that have led to atrocities in certain contexts, but perhaps not in others, what have been the intervening factors, so you know, what, what have been the responses that have helped or that haven't helped, that of course helps us when we then think about new situations, but always, I think, taking into account the very specific um, context. I think I'll stop. Mm. Mm. We need to wrap up, actually. Um, so I'd like to, to give each of you a couple of minutes to do that. And I would think I would like to start with Angela, because you kind of inadvertently, I think, set the tone with your concept of building <laughs> R2P back better. So uh, Angela, first, to give some concluding thoughts on our discussion today. Thanks very much. First, thank you so much. Uh, my concluding thought would just be this has been so useful for me. I've learned a lot, and, and I'm really grateful to all the speakers and, and, and to you hosting us, Ellen. I think this is great for our project. Um, I, I just wanted to just really, on one quick remark about um, knowledge and the lack of knowledge about these places that we would like to prevent atrocities in. I think that, the f that there is this incredible, unending, impossible to, to stop uh, tendency for us to believe that we can be experts about societies that we don't come from or live in regularly. That, that has, it's, we've failed. I mean, I remember that there were reports about people going to Rwanda who received a briefing packet and they didn't know where Rwanda was and they were sent on UN planes to Rwanda and and you know you you kind of really think I know that that still happens um, today I also um, am mindful that we're living also in a time where there's an enormous spread of information and social media and so there's also quite a lot of m m misinformation and information that can be thrown around without context. So I think that really there are two things to do f that should be part of any sort of international solidarity and effort to uh, prevent mass atrocities. And that, that, that's, that's really acknowledging and supporting local knowledge and local and researchers and academics and scholars um, who are based in these countries and live in these countries um, and at the same time creating lots of opportunities for you know fact-based evidence-based dialogue and engagement with policymakers um, around what is happening in Myanmar or Ethiopia Tigray or and I think that that also needs to be something that that we do with the media. Um, I, I, I mean, it seems sort of simplistic to, to kind of beat my drum about that, but I think that um, the, there's just way too many examples of intervention, peace building, peacekeeping, um, human rights ac activism, development assistance, which has, has been without real roots in local knowledge, but that's not to say that local uh, researchers and academics are unbiased and neutral and and fair and you know so I think that there needs to be a constant uh, level of skepticism and truth seeking and engagement around really building up really strong evidence based approaches and those will be my that will be my last word thank you well, that's a good good last word I think Cecilia yeah um, I have three final comments one uh, on Karen's uh, comment about putting order in your own house, then about knowledge, and then finally about human rights, the question from Van Hagtvedt. Now, um, Norway has been engaged for decades in uh, creating legal instruments that are legally binding in the field of, of, of atrocity, uh, not necessarily prevention, but at least international law relevant for these things. But we have not necessarily viewed this as something applicable to ourselves. 
So when the Norwegians, for instance, were supporting the establishment of the International Criminal Court during the 1990s, the ICC Rome Statute, where Norway was financing it, we were you know, heavily supporting it politically, but when we finally got the statute, it didn't really mean that we thought that we had to do anything in Norway. So we didn't really integrate it into our own laws because this was not about ourselves. This was about, you know, uh, regulating the rest of the world. So when the, the uh, tribunal for Rwanda was being wrapped up uh, and they were transferring some of the final cases to other countries where they could have the tribunals and finish them, they were, uh, the Norwegians were proposing to take one to Norway and the, and the judges, they looked at it and they said, well, <laughs> yes, okay, but you haven't got the proper laws. So we could not take it because we hadn't really put order in our own house. And this is a, it's a recurrent thing for the Norwegian engagement outside in terms of strengthening international law in this field. It, is, it has historically been seen <laughs> as something that is mostly applicable to others. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, needs to stop. Uh, and we need to look at ourselves as well. And when we engage in things outside of Norway, we need to make sure that we you practice the same thing as we preach. Now, this is the first thing. The second thing is the issue about knowledge. Now, I think the Norwegian experience in engagement in peace processes has, in some instances, been very successful. And, and some of the approach is basically that we need, we need to do certain things to bring a situation from a situation of armed conflict into a situation of of, of peace, a transition, and you can gather a lot of institutional knowledge from different processes and you can use them. And sometimes it is actually an advantage not to, to know so much about the context because you can then come in with a much more positive, optimistic view on what are the potentials. If you know too much, you will see all the problems. Now, this has been kind of, uh, I think, one of the reasons why the Norwegians have, we have gotten away with not having too much knowledge about the local context. But this is dangerous because knowing, and, and particularly when you move over to atrocity prevention, knowledge is the essence. If you do not know the dynamics and the actors and how things are shifting, that is when you end up with situations like Rwanda, because that was a peace uh, a transitional period. The same thing for Sri Lanka, and you can go on, on uh, to, to a number of other, of other situations. So I think that knowledge about local context is, in most cases, of the essence in order to be able to prevent atrocities from occurring or reoccurring. Uh, my final argument is going to be about human rights. Now, uh, is there an ambivalence about human rights? Well, I think at the core, I don't think there is an ambivalence about human rights in the world. And this includes the Chinese and the Russians. It includes everyone. Because if you compare the situation in the world today with the situation, for instance, 50 years ago, there are some things that are different. There are some things that are similar, and what is similar is that human rights will always operate in intrinsically political contexts. And human rights today are being institutionalized. A number of states have now introduced laws that allow them to have sanctions and pretty rough enforcement mechanisms directed at individuals in foreign countries for human rights violations. It's not war crimes, it is human rights violations. But th and this is being used on the one hand as a way of strengthening the human rights regime. However, it is occurring in a context of rivalry. Not merely rivalry between the major states in the world, but also rivalry about influence in third countries. And these instruments of human rights are being used and abused as one of the tools in that box. So it is intrinsically political. And I think that some of the reactions that we see in numerous states and the ambivalence also has to do with this. I still think that at the core, the world is still in a place where all states recognize that there are certain human rights violations that are unacceptable, there is a legal obligation 
to prevent them from happening and to respect them. And I, I, I am very worried that we are getting into this narrative that now the human rights are basically disappearing, the legal obligations to prevent atrocities. Look at the UN Security Council, look at what is happening in Yemen or in Syria, and this isn't working. That is not the case. And it is very important that we maintain the fact that the majority of states, they do relate to this. But there is an ambivalence because it is intrinsically political and it is being caught up in this overall more, uh, more dangerous and difficult geopolitical di dynamics. And I think for, for countries like Norway and Sweden, we are very we are becoming much smaller in such a climate than, when, than, than what we have used to be and that what we might be in 15 years from now. But I think that it is a period and it's very important that countries like Norway and Sweden do not fall into the trap of accepting that human rights is now a more ambivalent concept and you know there, there aren't legal obligations on states to prevent atrocities. We of all should, should not fall into that trap. And that will be my final word. Thank well, you. Thank you. Much. Another very good final word, Cecilia. Christophe, please. Okay, so there is much more to be said about this uh, topic. Uh, but in the interest of time, I think I'll just say that I agree with Angela and Cecilia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I learned a lot from, uh, from um, the, I, I mean, in terms of your last uh, comments. And I learned a lot uh, today from, uh, from, from your address and also in terms of what's actually been being done under so-called pillars one and, and two of the R2P agenda, evolving new best practices and so on that, uh, that one needs to take further, even if under a different um, name. Thanks a lot for arranging this and uh, yesterday's workshop, uh, Ellen. And, uh, that's Karen, thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah, I also I almost wanted to end at your point. I think that was such a strong point, right? So we really, I mean, we cannot give up. It's not, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just sit back and say, okay, now, you know, the world is falling to pieces. There's climate change, so let's just not do anything, um, and everything is terrible. So um, I think it's 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 particularly incumbent on states like Norway that have this reputation and that have this long history of being kind of you know moral compasses in the international system to continue to act strongly on some of these issues and to step up their game um, in the way that we've discussed as well. Um, and so perhaps, I mean, I wanted to end with, again, saying thanks to Evan for organizing this. I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important, spe specifically in light of your comments, Evan, as well, that this discussion probably needs to be happening more frequently um, in Norway. So just to all of you, because I think sometimes as individuals, one thinks, well, you know, what can I do um, to advance this in some way? And I think you know, every single person has a role to play in this. And so whether it is as a researcher, whether it is as um, somebody who's part of a community where you can call out discrimination against others when you see it, or perhaps when you experience it yourself. Um, many people these days are active on social media, right? So to identify hate speech, to counter that with positive narratives. So in small ways, I think you know, doing your bit uh, in terms of uh, really advocating for uh, these ideas at the domestic level, but then of course also at the international level, asking questions. I don't know how the political system here works in terms of you know, whether you can write a letter uh, to somebody in parliament and say, what are you doing in terms of what's going on in Ethiopia? Or send a letter to the newspaper and say, well, I'd like to know, I'd like to hear from the Norwegian foreign ministry what exactly it is they're, they're doing to help prevent atrocities um, in country X, Y, or Z. Um, so, you know, use that. Use your power as an individual. And I just also just wanted to say thank you so much for yeah, coming to spend your Tuesday morning with us. Mm. And on that note, uh, a big hand to our participants. Thank you so much for coming. It was a wonderful ending. <laughs>